Welcome to Lore Drop, right here at Eligible Monster. We started this channel off by bringing you lore to some of your favorite video games and explaining some of the concepts in your favorite video games that were a little more difficult to understand or you just wanted more clarification on. Since a lot of our original videos are from five years ago and most of those series have had new games and their lore has been retconned, changed, or just more things have been added, we thought about bringing back Lore Drop for some newer games, but also revisiting some of the older games with a new format, a method that will explain what happened in the games, but maybe deep dive into some of your favorite lore elements. Give you like a glancing over of the whole thing while explaining things a little bit better that you may not have understood so well. Resident Evil is a series that has been a fan favorite game series since first coming out back in March of 1996 on the PlayStation 1, spanning all the way up to the current generation consoles with the release of Resident Evil 7. There have been many adaptations to the horror series coming in the form of books, movies, and even card games. But while many people can argue over which entry of the games are the best entry, we'll be taking a look at where it all started today with Resident Evil 1. And unlike our original video, I won't be using a weird voice or anything along those lines, and I hope to help you understand the elements of Resident Evil 1 a little bit better so you can enjoy more of the Resident Evil games that are coming out, including a remake of Resident Evil 2 which hasn't actually come out as of the time of making this video. Now, the game was originally set on July 24th, 1998, and it takes place just outside of the Midwestern town of Raccoon City, where a string of bizarre murders have been taking place. People have made reports that they have seen groups of people attacking families and then eating them. As the claims have begun to pile up, Raccoon City Police Department has sent out an elite team known as STARS, which stands for the Special Tactics and Rescue Service to investigate. Now, STARS was a local police special forces unit compiled of hand-picked operatives from ex-military all the way to academic civilians suited for positions across the police department. The goal of STARS was to be used as a unit to fight back against terrorism as well as deal with a rise in urban crime in the surrounding areas led by police chief Brian Irons. After contact was lost with the first group, Bravo Team, the second group, Alpha Team, was sent in to figure out what had happened to the original team. Leading Alpha Team was Commanding Officer Albert Wesker. Remember that name as he's going to come up quite a bit in this entire franchise. With him was Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, two other individuals that will come up quite a bit, Barry Burton and Joseph Frost. While searching the forest that is northwest of Raccoon City, Alpha Team does manage to locate Bravo Team's downed helicopter, and after they take a closer look, they discover no survivors. But before the team could gather any more information, they're attacked by a pack of grotesque and mutated dogs, forcing everyone to flee. The Alpha Team pilot, Brad Vickers, panics and runs off on his own, and everyone else begins to take shelter in a nearby abandoned mansion. Now, the unique feature in Resident Evil was having the choice between picking the story between Jill and Chris, each having their own routes and obstacles, something that's not too unique in today's gaming age. Jill would start with an extra inventory and a lockpick, while Chris had access to better weapons and was able to take more hits. Depending on which character role you chose, there are slight changes in how the story is told and who is met up with along the way, but they both result in the same overall plot. As the characters begin to progress in the storyline, the team split up to try and find clues in the mansion that may help them with their case of the missing stars members of Bravo Team. As each character begins to move through the early parts of the mansion, they encounter a dead body with what seems like a zombie eating it. Regardless of who is chosen, once the zombie is dealt with, the player will then find themselves split up from the other members of their group and forced to search for them on their own. If Jill was your chosen character, after the zombie was attacked, you would hear one of Barry's famous quotes to Jill as they split up to look for Wesker. He hands her a lockpick, telling her, Jill, here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. The very first Resident Evil game was never known for its amazing voice acting talent. At this point, depending on the characters that you've selected, the player would then begin to explore different parts of the mansion, both trying to reach the same goal. As Chris, the player would eventually run into Bravo Team member Richard Aiken, who was injured in being tended to by Bravo Team's new recruit, Rebecca Chambers. Now, timeline-wise, shortly before this, Rebecca's own sort of prequel game, Resident Evil Zero, will take place. We'll cover that game at a later date, though. As of the time of Resident Evil 1 coming out, there was no idea that there would even be a Rebecca Chambers game ever. While Rebecca's trying to help Richard, she explains that Richard has been bitten by a large poisonous snake, and if they don't treat Richard soon, he will die from the toxin. Here, if the player is fast 
fast enough, they could run to a certain part of the mansion that contained the cure and return it, actually saving Richard, but he still ends up dying anyway. Around this time, if you're Jill, she starts to uncover some information that people may have been held as prisoners to be experimented on in the mansion by a man known as Sir Spencer. At this point in the game, not much is known about Sir Spencer, but we will later learn that he is Oswell E. Spencer, a virologist and a eugenicist. He became one of the founding members of Umbrella Pharmaceuticals, later to become known as Umbrella Corporation, the recurring villain for most of the early games in this franchise. With plenty of financial backing and an idea of wanting to become a god, Spencer started to experiment on people with the progenitor virus. Soon after, the progenitor virus will serve as a catalyst to become the bioterrorist agent known as the T-Virus, the virus infecting people and changing them into zombies. Regardless of who deals with the giant snake that attacked Richard, Jill continues her investigation and walks by a room where she hears Barry talking to someone. That someone is Wesker, and he's telling Barry about his mission to destroy the Star's team. And Barry seemingly goes along with it. As Jill is trying to listen, she can't fully understand what's being said and soon enters the room. Looking around, not knowing Wesker was just there, she just assumes Barry was talking to himself and becomes slightly worried about him. Later, the player continues to explore and finds a hidden cave system, and in it, Bravo Team Commander Arico has been previously injured. He warns the player that there is a traitor amongst their Star's unit, planted by the Umbrella Corporation to betray them if the time ever came. But before he could go into further detail, he shot by an unseen person and unable to finish stating who it was that might be the traitor. You know, it's a horror game, so they're going with horror tropes. You never learn who it is until they're messing with you. As the player moves into the secret underground laboratory complex, they learn more about who the Umbrella Corporation is and how it's heavily involved in their mission. The Umbrella Corporation wasn't just involved in pharmaceuticals. They're a conglomeration of subsidiaries in very different industries. Though they have a large influence over the pharmaceutical market, they've also developed chemical and consumer cosmetics and even industrial machines. Obviously, the goal of having such a far reach in so many industries was to help cover up their illegal activities. While Chris runs into Rebecca again, Jill learns the secret that Enrico was trying to tell the player. The person that was planted within their ranks and assigned to this facility was Albert Wesker. As Jill processes this disturbing information, she rushes out to try and find Wesker to make him answer for his crimes. However, not long after leaving, Jill is stomped and held at gunpoint by Barry under direct orders from Wesker himself. Barry forces Jill into another room where she's met face to face by Wesker, and he tells her that she should not have any ill will towards Barry. Barry was merely doing his bidding because the Burton family is currently being held hostage. Wesker then explains his role with an umbrella and their goal of activating something called the Tyrant Program. Tyrant was a monster designed specifically to hunt down and kill any Living Stars members until there was none left. While Wesker begins to start at the program, Barry finally builds up the courage to go against Wesker's orders, shooting him. He quickly runs over to Jill, telling her that he's so sorry for all of this. However, what he doesn't see is that Wesker is still managing to activate the Tyrant. Just then, a massive humanoid creature bursts out of its test tube, running straight for Barry. However, just before Barry can attack, it suddenly stops and changes changes his mind and kills Wesker first. As Jill and Barry escape, they run into Chris and Rebecca, who on their own learned that Wesker had betrayed them. Once the four eventually meet up, they activate the facility's self-destruct system as they begin to leave, and just as they do, they receive an incoming message from Brad Vickers, who says that he's currently low on fuel and he's going to have to be leaving soon. While Rebecca splits off to activate the countdown, Chris, Jill, and Barry are stopped by the tyrant who bursts out from beneath the helipad. Brad begins to panic, wanting to leave, but seeing everyone fighting against the tyrant, he decides he needs to help, shifting the helicopter and dropping a rocket launcher from its side, as the player uses the rocket launcher to finally stop the tyrant. Brad lands to pick up the four of them and escape the mansion, returning safely back to Raccoon City. Now there's tons of little bits here and there that are scattered throughout the game to go much, much deeper into its lore, but this is the core story with the important bits further explained for this moment. The series would continue on for many more games and even have a brief prequel with Rebecca learning more about Umbrella and Wesker's involvement, and we will be covering that, don't worry. The next game in the series we'll be looking at will take place in Raccoon City itself, being played by either the rookie cop, Leon S. Kennedy, or Chris Redfield's sister, Claire. Don't forget to subscribe to keep up the data as to what we're doing over here at Eligible Monster, getting a hold of all of our podcasts, our gameplay, and our lore drops. I hope you guys enjoy, and I hope you'll stick around. Until then, viewers, gather those herbs and collect those ink ribbons. We'll see you in the next lore drop.